Hello. Hello, people. Welcome to another coffee chat. I always am so, 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 so excited for these, of course, because I get to be able to do some wonderful interviews with Mackenzie Finkley. Like, that's that's always an iconic moment. <laughs> but um, I think that this coffee chat in particular is like what I need for my soul. Um, today Honestly, we're same. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about how to sustain our creativity and particularly in the midst of things like NaNoWriMo, which is like really much across the writing world. It's such like a grind sesh, you know? Like I think that this yeah. conversation will really help anchor us and like remember that we are human beings and creativity is a beautiful thing, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't do it at the expense of our health and we shouldn't like do like yes. emotional burnout. What are your thoughts, Mackenzie, before we invite our yeah. wonderful guest today? We got to take care of ourselves out here, and it's really easy to fall victim to burnout, because even with creative stuff, we we tend to push ourselves to the limit. So I'm excited to learn more about um, both creating you know, sustainable, consistent habits when it comes to writing, um, and also making sure we're taking care of ourselves along the way. But yes, I could use some motivation today. I don't know about you. No, a thousand percent, a million percent. So, I mean, I've had the privilege of, you know, we've had the privilege of working with these authors inside of our community, but, you know, after their books have been published, they've gone on and done some pretty incredible things. And so without further ado, I mean, I'm excited to learn from them. And I know you are too, Mackenzie. So without further ado, dramatic general. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Allison. All right. Welcome so, to the party. Welcome to the pate and the coffee shop for the coffee chat. So um, would you two like to introduce yourselves? How about you start, Allison? Um, I'm Allison Kendall, and I'm the author of the book Good Night and Good Luck. Um, I'm a mother of two boys, and I have a small business that I'm currently in the back storage <laughs> storage room of. So. Boss, we love to hear it. <laughs> we love to hear it. All right. Um, my name is Laura Evans. I'm the author of Silent Seasons, Chasing Sustainability Through the Law. I am an environmental planner, but I used to be a Texas licensed, well, I'm still a Texas licensed environmental attorney, but I used to practice law in Texas. Um, and yeah, now I do environmental planning. I wrote this book, yeah, about a year ago is when I started in the Book Creators Program. And yeah, I have really um, been, I have been sustaining my creativity, but it's been a little tricky. Um, so yeah, I just uh, have been, I woke up early to write the book. And then yeah, I do a lot of, a lot of environmental planning work, sustainability, climate change planning, resilience planning, and all of, all of that all day, every day. <laughs> I, oh, I guess I also live in Buffalo, New York um, with my partner and his son, and I have a garden as well. Oh, that's so wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned both Texas and New York because the yeah. Kenzie's from Texas and I live in New York. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> I lived in Austin for my 20s, and I've been back here since 2015 in Western New York. Wild. That's so cool. It's a small world after all. Always. Well, something that I just wanted to quickly shout out from the chat today is like, clearly, like I'm super excited for this discussion, but clearly our audience is too. Like, so let's just dive right into it, shall we? Yeah. So for our first question, I mean, again, it's been an absolute privilege working with both of you throughout the book program within our community. But when was the moment that you knew that you wanted to write a book? Because that's like a very specific medium for channeling creativity. Do we, is there a particular way we- or No, not or? at all. Yeah, go ahead and jump in. Whoever okay. feels like starting. Do you want to do like every other Allison? Is that what we should do? Okay, I'll start this one first. All right. So um, I have wanted to write a book probably my whole life, um, really, like, since I remember, like, second grade, we would, like, get to, like, kind of publish our books um, in class, and I've just wanted to do it my whole life. Um, but this particular book, I started 
uh, trying to put together in December 2020 um, by myself. <laughs> it was kind of, uh, yeah, it was, you know, months into the pandemic. I had taken a pandemic pause and was kind of getting back into environmental planning. And I just really wanted to write about my experiences. I felt like I was very alone in the environmental law and sustainability space. And so I really just wanted to write about what I have known and experienced and share it with others. Um, but yeah, it's been like really a lifetime in the making, but oh, and then I guess I failed, you know, I couldn't do it alone and then I kind of gave up on it. And then uh, someone recommended this to me the year later and now I'm here. I have to say I'm probably pretty similar. I've wanted to be an author and have a book for many, many years since probably fourth grade for me. Um, but so my book is a memoir. I didn't say that when I introduced myself. Um, and it's about my journey with grief in the year after my dad died. So my dad died in 2016 and I had the idea to write this book almost exactly a year later, um, after my first son was born and the people who showed up in the hospital for my son's birth were the same people who showed up for me the night I found out my dad died. And so it was a, um, it was really that highlight for me of life and death. And I live, I had a lot of life experiences in that first year um, that included finding out I was pregnant. <laughs> and um, I just really wanted to, I, I felt very alone. I was, I was pretty young when my dad died. It was in my late twenties. And there weren't a lot of people who in my life had had that experience yet. And so I had the idea to write this book at that stage and could never manage to put my butt in a chair and, and write it until somebody told me about the Creator Institute. And now here I am. BRB sobbing. I like, I was like, I'm tearing up and I can't do that on camera. So this is a great segue into our next question, actually. <laughs> Very convenient. Writing in particular, can be cathartic in helping us to navigate intense topics such as life, death, and you know other effects to the human condition. Um, how do you embrace that catharsis and avoid emotional burnout? So I'll go ahead since we're doing every other. Um, the writing this book, and for me, writing is really the best way to feel our feelings. I think um, it's a release. And it was a release that I didn't know I needed until I was writing the book. I, I didn't really grieve my dad's death until I was sitting every week working for three hours at a time, going through some of the hardest moments of my life. Um, and honestly, for me, the way I didn't burn out was I just like I had my deadlines. Right. And like I just that was the only thing that kept me going because otherwise I could have just quit and I could have given up on myself and the dream. But um, the deadlines helped keep me on track and gave me a focus and an end goal. And it was like, okay, there are other people. The community is also a huge factor in that, or at least it was for me, is that there are other people that are doing this right along with me. Like I'm not alone. There are other people that are struggling at times and then feeling super successful at other times and so like that ebb and flow is also I think what what helped me stay stay motivated and not burn out yeah so um I guess yeah my book was really intense because it went through all of the different seasons of my life where I've been silent about what I've learned um, about sustainability issues and environmental issues and environmental law so yeah, I am always grappling with like the existential issues of like how we all live on this planet and like what we're doing to it and not doing for it. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of grief there and I, I have a deep connection to the natural world. And so, um, yeah, no, it's been, it's been so intense. Uh, but basically, um, yeah, writing this book, I guess the thing that I didn't realize that would be so intense is that like in order to write a book, you have to go through like all of your memories to like pick out which ones <laughs> you're going to share. Because I'm basically I was teaching the book teaches environmental law through my experiences. So 
I explained like all these different jobs that I like took on and then quit because they weren't sustainable. So having to relive all of those experiences was way more intense than I ever thought. Um, I like Cassandra um, Sterling was my editor and she's absolutely amazing. And like, she, I don't know, I feel like I got therapy from her, like in a lot of ways. Um, just meeting with her every week is definitely like how I how I got through it. Um, I actually did go to real therapy, so I always recommend that. Um, that's just always something I kind of turn to in times that I need to. But I do feel like I went through a grieving process that has brought, I mean, I'm, I still get emotional about it and I always will, but I really do feel like I came out the other side, like a very different person. Um, and yeah, I think I've blocked out some of the difficult things, but um, yeah. And then I also, um, but yeah, to avoid the emotional burnout, I mean, Cassandra, she really was like, plan something fun for like after your writing sessions, you know? So I did that like a lot. Um, I, my, I'm fortunate enough that my parents live on like a dead end road next to a forest. So I was like going out in the woods, like all the time. Um, yeah, getting outside in nature and then, yeah, talking to my partner about everything. He really walked me through stuff. So yeah, reaching out to other people. I think I wanted to participate more in the community than I even was able to, but I did get a lot of support like in person and I, I, yeah, I loved all of that. And then, yeah, Cassandra was the best. <laughs> so yeah. Having an We're editor all... that you have a good relationship with is like, it's life changing, life affirming. I love mm -hmm. that tip about planning something fun after your writing session. I really, I think I could benefit from that. No, a yeah. hundred percent. And also like you both said such beautiful things that we're actually going to pick up on in like later questions today. But to, to as a interesting segue from what Laura just said, yeah. what do you do when you take breaks? Okay. So you kind of, yeah. so you already mentioned that, for example, that you go out to you, mm -hmm. what you explore the woods, et cetera. Like, yeah. did, were there other examples of like fun things that you would plan after writing sessions? Yeah. I mean, so I, like, right now I'm like my parents, they live like 30 minutes away more in a town area and I'm, I'm in Buffalo. So I can't just like go out and walk in the woods. So I have like, you know, over the ear Bluetooth headphones that I would like, play whatever like album I was interested in in the moment. And I know everyone here is a big Taylor Swift fan. So yeah, I'm listening to Midnight's a lot right now. Um, and I just, yeah, I like put that on and just, you know, like do, do whatever in my head, dance around and just kind of um, just listen to someone else being creative. Um, I also did, uh, it's kind of funny that my editor was named uh, Cassandra because um, I also listened to the audiobook Cassandra Speaks, like while I was writing, and that like helped me a lot. Um, just give me like motivation, and like so I would like listen to that when I was like cooking was another thing and doing the dishes. So I was big part of my book is like um, personal sustainability practices, <laughs> like cooking, having fun, going outside, and so I was trying to like practice what I was preaching um, during the book. Easier said than done. A lot of times I would just veg out on the couch or whatever, but um, yeah, that's kind of what I did. Keeping things alive, if, if one Oh, right, say. yeah. And then, yeah, I've been podcasting throughout. I did not podcast much when I was writing this book. I like, <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't able to, but yeah, that's been a thing. Yeah, keeping things alive is is my podcast and website and just generally what I what I'm trying to do. Yeah, for me, I think the the creative breaks or when I would take breaks in writing, I mean, it, that would be when I would have like a dance party with my kids in the kitchen. I mean, so, similar things, like I would listen to music. And um, one of the things that I like to do is I, I like to find other creative outlets to keep the creativity like going, like not just writing, but like, I try to do watercolor and I am not good at watercolor. <laughs> it is much harder than I always think it is, but just something that is a change of pace for me. Um, and specifically when I would get in those like three hour chunks, when I would take like the 15 minute break or anything like that, um, I would try to stretch, do yoga, something that keeps like movement going. 
Yeah, as the daughter of like, well, I'm the daughter of two military parents, and one of them is now a fitness trainer and health coach. So movement is always a thing that they tell me to do on breaks. And I'm a good daughter. I've adopted it a little. (laughs) It's supposed to like, apparently endorphins are a thing, and that'll help you when you release those. They like center your creative brain. So that tracks. (laughs) Before we move on to our next question, I'm just super curious. What about you, Mackenzie? What do you do on breaks? Yes, and I hope that you can hear me okay, because it's been yeah. kind of spotty. But for me, when I'm on breaks, I definitely vibe with the idea of like doing other things that are creative. Like right now, I've decided to take part in local theater, <laughs> a local theater production, which is proving to take up a little bit more of my time than I was anticipating. But it is definitely fostering my my creative brain, because a lot of the work that I'm doing is with character work, which is similar to what I'm doing and working on a novel. So Uh, there's definitely alignment there. Another thing for me is writing with someone else, which kind of brings me to our next question about, you know, where do you enjoy engaging in the writing community most? For me, it's having some kind of writing buddy that I can go out in person and like hang out at a coffee shop, sit together and just write and exist somewhere that, you know, like when you get up and go to the bathroom, they can watch your stuff. And you can bounce ideas off of them. It's just, it's all good things all around. Um, So I'd love to know um, your thoughts. Laura, you had mentioned that you wanted to, you wished you could have engaged more, but um, what were some of the things you enjoyed most? Yeah, I guess I, I haven't, I guess I'm not that practiced at engaging with community online. So that's kind of what I mean with like just doing more online. Cause I feel like where I did, it was very like wonderful. Um, But I definitely um, bounce a lot of ideas off of my partner who I live with, who, yeah, I guess is basically a writing partner, too, because I'm helping him uh, write his own book as well. So and then we do the podcast together and things like that. So, yeah, I guess in that way. um, But, yeah, I'm definitely more of an in-person person. person. (laughs) So like later tonight, I'm having an event in Buffalo um, at a bookstore called Burning Books. Um, and I'm really excited about that. So I know that there's a lot of writers um, that'll be coming out for that. And yeah, just trying to talk to people. But honestly, I feel like I'm really at the beginning of all of this journey because this is my first book and like it only came out like a month ago. So yeah, I have a I have a lot more community to meet. Um, but so far, it's it's mostly been the in-person um, and I'm trying to do better with online. For me, I think the engagement with the community has been um, like that. That's one of the things that was always missing for me. I'm in a small town. I don't know many other people that are writers or even um, that have that that as their outlet. Um, so, like, I have tried NaNoWriMo in the past, and I'm just in a part that is. It's just there's not a lot of people. So the community that I actually joined a morning writing group during the pandemic that was all virtual and they people are in New York and DC and North Carolina. And um, actually the woman who leads it is who got me into the Creator Institute. And her name's Alicia and she wrote the book, Little Failures. Um, so I'm in her morning writing group and every morning we meet and it's just that, that to me is the community that I didn't realize I was missing. And so I've been able to connect with people during the pandemic and beyond that have really helped foster that, so. Amazing segue into our next question. <laughs> like, the way, like the way you guys are answering questions, like, wow, it's like everything is moving together so seamlessly. So you guys did an excellent job of like emphasizing the significance of community and talking about how you've interfaced in different ways and how you've been able to incorporate into your routine, ways you're thinking of incorporating it even more into your, your, your routine. Like, so why, if there's a, so an, a writer somewhere feeling like they're struggling in isolation, why do you think it's important for authors to pursue external accountability or to pursue community? It's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I think, like, I mean, and Eric Coster says it the best, like, don't write alone. It's, it's just this idea of, you know, whenever you have somebody to bounce ideas off of or 
to sit in a room with you or to sit virtually with you and just hold space. It just, I, I just think that it creates a container that allows for so much more to grow. And, you know, one person is wonderful, but when you can get other people's energy involved, it just creates a stronger situation and a stronger relationship. And I think that the outcome ultimately is, you know, those moments when you're feeling like, oh, or that inner critic is like really speaking to you and going like, this is not good. Like, why are you doing this? You should be pursuing a different career. <sighs> that person in your community can be like, no, you, this is good. Like you, you are doing what you need to be doing and let me help you through this slump and get you back up. And, you know, my editor was huge for that. Mazelle was my editor and I just, we had a great relationship, great back and forth. And she was a huge help to me during my, my low period. We love the editor appreciation. <laughs> we stand editor appreciation on this, on this coffee chat. Oh yeah. Um, I would say I, I wouldn't be here without the external accountability. Cause yeah, I've, I have tried to write a book before and it just has never really, it has never worked. So yeah, there is that. Um, I also, in my own work too, I mean, I definitely, sorry, there's no noise, but um, I definitely just, uh, I always work under deadlines. I wish I didn't, you know, I wish it was more consistent, but if I, I just remember March 4th uh, of this year and that's just like burned into my brain now. <laughs> um, but I had to have that or else I never would have, turned in anything so yeah I just I needed the external accountability in order in order to write and publish the book absolutely yeah having a person like your editor or a community or a target date like honestly for me it's that it's the accountability slash motivation it's like trying mm -hmm. to have a workout buddy right you say right. like we're gonna meet at the gym at this time you're like yeah. I don't want to go ah uh, but they're gonna be there so Mm -hmm. It's a little bit for you and it's also a little bit for them. Um, yeah, that's my two cents on that, Kyra. What are your thoughts? I mean, no, I completely concur with all aforementioned statements in that. I, I think that external accountability can, I mean, while I also love like working with people and things like body doubling and, and, and like things like that, like just knowing like when you tell other people that you're writing a book, now you gotta follow through. You can't just be like, and like, I'm not doing that anymore. Like, and it's funny that you mentioned um, like being like deadlines, because I mean, even throughout our process, we've talked about the difference between deadline writers, habitual writers, and then um, episodic writers. Through this process, I learned that I'm episodically habitual <laughs> and like just sort of like, adjusting to the way that I work, but also knowing that on the other side of this project, there are readers that I get to commune with. And that's true for all of us. So I guess I did have one more like quick follow-up question for you guys before we move on to like our last official question. But it's interesting how you both talked about like external accountability and how that really like helped motivate you throughout the process um, and particularly the strong relationships that you have with your editors. but. Something that happens, and I'm sure y'all can relate to this because I'm, it, it happened to all of us at one point. When you opened your book to like external feedback, there's like this weird line between being held accountable, like what your audience wants and like being true to your initial message. And there could be like a real emotional strain, not just about articulating what you wanna articulate, but also meeting the needs or the desires of your audience. So I guess like how, how did you maintain, sustain like your well-being or your creativity while receiving feedback from other people? I guess I can go. Um, I'm, maybe I blocked all this part out. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think that I really like I mean, a lot of my early readers, like they really like loved it and they um, appreciated like the new information that I was sharing with them that they didn't have before. Um, I think like the criticisms and like, 
I have, a, it's kind of hard for me to answer that because I have such a strange, to not, it's not a strange topic, but it's one that like people don't know a lot about. And so they're very interested, but I guess I just try to stay grounded in myself and like my values and like what I really like have been wanting to say for like literally years. So it, um, I don't know. And I, I really just felt like a lot of the feedback was super helpful. Like even when things were critical, it made it better. Um, so I, I never felt like that hurt about it. Um, because yeah, even if it was like a harsher comment, it, it always was something I hadn't thought of before. Yeah, I'll say for me, um, <clears throat> I actually was one of, so in, in my cohort, I had reached the point where I was starting to work with my MRE and it was, and I gotten the feedback of the, there was something like the book just wasn't quite there and I could, you know, extend and, and put the publishing date later. And this goes back to your previous question as well. But for me, it was the readers on the other end and I am definitely a deadline writer. And I was like, no, I just need to push through and I need to have that like kind of scary, like you're going to publish later, which is not scary at all. There's nothing wrong with that. It just, for me, it was one of the things that was a driving factor. Um, I'm also like really, when I write, I try to hold what I write to myself as close as possible. Like I don't like to let other people see it because I have that inner critic of thinking, oh, it's not good enough. Oh, like the people who tell me it's good are just telling me that because they're my friends and family. So the people, I was very specific in the people that I let read it early on. And it was the best choice that I could have made because between them and my editor, I was getting the feedback of, okay, you're, you're tiptoeing, like you're not going deep enough. And like the best example that I can give is, you know, my book is about like my family members are in it, but I refer to them as my brother or like, I, I, I kind of keep them, I kept every character and every part at a distance instead of like being like, this was me, this is my brother, Matt, like, and naming them and pulling the audience, that's the readers, into the day-to-day. -day. And so for me, that that initial feedback was like, okay, you, you, you got to let go a little bit. And I did, and it completely changed my book. Um, so I think trusting my gut on who I let read it and then hearing their feedback and there were sometimes where I mean it was a hard book to write it was incredibly emotional and really difficult at times and there were certain you know there were certain critiques and criticisms that I got that was saying I really want you to go deeper and I would say I I can't like I can't and the analogy I said was like, I, I can't bleed any more than I've already bled into this book um, or into this part. So for me, it was just trusting that, that intuition. Mm. Yeah, really not deep. wanting yeah. to let people see your work is a little bit of a problem when we also want to be a published author. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very yeah. Well, you just, said, Alison reminded me that one of the feed, pieces of feedback that I got early on um, from my from Cassandra was that I was I'm such a technical writer, like that's my day job. So I wasn't adding enough of my feelings and emotions into it. Mm -hmm. And I think I had like a moment of like, feeling like, oh, man, I messed up and like my, you know, inner critic, like whatever. But then I was like, oh, she's so right. And then as soon as I started adding feelings into it, it made a lot more sense. So yeah, that was a that was a thing that happened. Yeah. Very cool. Well, ladies, uh, it has been a joy asking and talking about all of these questions. We do have one more prepared question left for you guys. And so in line with all the advice you've been giving, the experiences that you've had, do you have any kind of any parting words of wisdom for authors, aspiring authors, writers? I mean, I think for me, the thing I would say is write the book. <sighs> just sit down and do it and don't be afraid of it. Like, I mean, it's just put yourself in the seat and put the words to the paper or the keys. Um, yeah. Share the story, whatever it is. 
I was going to say something really similar. Like, I guess I've just learned that it's really important for me to tell my story. And then it's really important for other people to tell their stories too. And, you know, I see like a lot of patterns of like really famous books being like, you know, oh, a famous person already like wrote a book, but there's just so many people with so many like deep experiences that like really need to be shared. And I think, yeah, everybody that all four of us are, are included in that. And so I just really, yeah, I want people to, to share what they know and what they've seen and what they believe because, oh, I guess I'll leave something that someone told me that I love is clarity is kindness. And I really think that's like super true um, when we're, we're speaking truth about, yeah, what we've seen, believe and know. <laughs> so, yeah, write it. <laughs> write, the, write the book and clarity is kindness. Those are both so awesome. Well, again, it's been such a privilege to have you both on Coffee Chat. Please feel free to swing by anytime. We'd love to have <laughs> you back. I love this conversation. We learned so much. <laughs> um, well, I hope that you, well, we hope that you both have a wonderful rest of your day. And again, if you have any questions for us, you want to swing back right on back, you know how to reach us. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been Thank yeah, you. privilege to be here. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, beautiful people. So that was awesome. <laughs> that was literally so incredible. I needed that conversation today. And ultimately, I, I hope that we all like learn from it. But ultimately, if you guys have any topics that you want to discuss on Coffee Chat, don't hesitate to drop them in the comments below because we do look at comments and we do incorporate that feedback into what we plan in the future. Um, next week, we're going to be talking to, at a slightly different time, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to be talking to Sanem Ganel and she's going to teach us how to make the most of Medium as a platform because she actually runs something called the Medium Writers Academy. So a professional. She, she knows what she's talking about when it comes to media. So it'll be super exciting to have her then. But for future topics, don't hesitate to let us know. And if you want to reach out to us uh, outside of dropping your thoughts in the comments below, you can find Mackenzie and I at our Instagram handles and, and they are trickling across the stream. And ultimately, we're just so glad that you guys joined us. And onward and upwards for more fun conversations. Here's the coffee chat. Bye, everybody.